since understanding I do have gripping anxiety, I've built a lifestyle which revolves around prevention of poor mental health around anxiety and outdoors adventures running sports that sort of thing has really helped my my perspective with my mental health i find that i get this thing called flow this optimal state of consciousness like it said um, those moments of total absorption you know when you're not there anymore like your your self vanishes and you know time time kind of disappears and you're just you're just in the moment And I get that from like trail running or from outdoor sports. Some people get it from drawing or, you know, creating art, or some people might get it from meditation or making music. I get it from outdoor sports. And so when I'm almost doing these challenges, they almost are like prescriptions, nature prescriptions. I'm getting my time in flow. I'm in a happy state and I really, I really do find them really enjoyable. Hello again and welcome to another episode of the Running Tales podcast where we explore the incredible stories of runners from all around the world from Olympians to park runners. I'm Craig Lewis and the voice you just heard is that of Isaac Kenyon. Isaac is a runner, cyclist, triathlete and extreme adventurer who uses the power of his challenges both to inspire others and to raise awareness of mental health and climate change causes. His most recent adventure saw Isaac complete a full distance Ironman, but with the addition of wearing a 15 kilogram weighted vest, the vest representing the unseen weight of mental health issues. I talked to Isaac about how he has confronted his own anxiety problems, learnt to embrace the great outdoors, and even become one of the youngest international keynote speakers in the world. But I started our conversation by asking him about his latest challenge and why he added such an extreme twist to it sure sure. and yeah uh, if people don't know me um you know i'm isaac and uh, i often do a lot of uh, endurance challenges and and i call them purposeful endurance challenges because they're more than just overcoming the adversity there's a message behind it and that's why this twist was in this iron man and um it was a full distance iron man but i wore a 15 kg weighted vest uh, I swam with the 15 kg um, weighted vest on me. I, I cycled and and ran um, as part of the full distance Ironman with, with it on. Uh, and metaphorically, it was meant to carry a message, a mental health message, um, which is you know the weight that we carry with us that's hidden. So I was trying to visually show the weight that people take in their minds when they're suffering or dealing with poor mental health. And yeah, it was. Uh, I, I I have gone through poor mental health myself and I can say that actually really bad mental health is worse than the weighted vest. I can conclusively say that <laughs> it's a lot harder. The day's a lot harder, but I did try to metaphorically make it a really difficult day <laughs> and I certainly succeeded. It was a difficult day. <laughs> yeah, just constant. I, I want to get onto the, the, the kind of mental health message and all that stuff for sure, but but just concentrating quickly on, on the actual challenge itself. I mean, how hard was it to carry that extra weight, particularly when swimming as well, which you would have had to do, of course? Yes, yeah. I mean, there's so much um, variables uh, that um, people have maybe not thought about. So of course, the weight is heavy. So when you're swimming, you're going to have to, I guess, replace that extra buoyancy that you've lost. So um, as a swimmer, I was training very, very hard on my kick because kick keeps you buoyant. The main issue with wearing a weighted vest is think about when you dive into into the water and you, you take that deep breath, your lungs expand, you know, your chest expand. Yeah. Well, I had constriction. I didn't have the full space to get my full breaths in. So I had to train myself to be able to swim with limited breaths. I was probably taking in half of what I would usually take in air because of the constriction of wearing a weighted vest. Um, So that was extremely challenging too. And then you got to think about the weight that's actually on the muscles. So yes, there's a lot of weight pulling you down, but think of every arm stroke. I, I, I almost had to lift the weight on my shoulder so it was almost like 15 kg sort of shoulder presses if you if you're into gym stuff it's like yeah. 15 kg shoulder presses every arm stroke <laughs> and because you're in balance because you've got weight on your I had it on my top body so I had it like a vest on my top body 
when they tell you to swim efficiently, they they tell you to um sort of go side to side, almost perpendicular, like twist your whole body so that less of your body is going through the surface area. The problem with a weighted vest when you do that is that the, there is a big big imbalance. So you could twist and end up like flipping your stuff onto your back quite quickly, if if that makes sense. And the weight's compensating. So it was really hard for me to do efficient swimming as well. So I couldn't really cut through the water as quickly as I usually could. So I had a lot of drag and I had a lot of inefficient swimming. And yeah, it was a really tough part. Um, And yeah, I think that on on itself, the swim was probably the most dangerous part um, based on those on those factors. Then when it came to the cycle, you know, it was a little bit less uh, dangerous. But during the swim, of course, I could always uh, take it off. You know, should there be emergency, I could take it off. And I had a support kayaker who was who was next to me. So, you know, should something have happened, I could you know get quickly, um, you know, to the shore. Uh, but I didn't have any sort of sides to hold on to or anything. I wasn't in a pool. I was in the middle of a lake. Um, so I did make it a bit more challenging that way. <laughs> it was a bit more uh, daunting. Um I even I did have a panic attack at the beginning, and um, so just yeah, you know, as an FYI, I don't recommend doing this for fun. <laughs> it was like it was I had a panic attack because I had previously been training to enter the water very gently, and the film crew thought it would be really because I had a film crew follow this journey. So people listening, they can watch the film later. But I had to <laughs> I dived in. Uh, as part of the film and I wasn't used to the shock of that dive in so I had a bit of a panic attack because you know when you first enter the water and then you get your breaths in in cold water it was a bit like that but I had always entered the water very slowly in all my training but I didn't and because the film crew asked for a dive I wasn't ready for that so I had a bit of a panic attack to be there. I had to take some time to you know take in the surroundings relaxed I was treading water trying to get my breath but it was quite hard to do like you know, those breaths weren't possible because I couldn't get the full air because of the vest constriction. So it took me some time to do short breaths eventually to sort of settle myself. But yeah, that, that the challenge was a lot in the swim. The cycle generally felt like having a lot more weight to carry. I don't know if anybody's listening is a cycled person, but it was basically like cycle touring. And run was quite hard with the weighted vest. I found that quite challenging on the knees and the joints. Yeah, it it took its toll. And I think it is really a, it's a fascinating um, comparison that you've made in terms of carrying that weight of mental health. And, And one thing that I thought was really interesting was you saying, obviously you had this panic attack, it wasn't easy, but you had the option to take that weight off during your triathlon. Now, if we're carrying around or people are carrying around the weight of mental health, they often without help they they don't have that option to take that that weight off do they 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 are potentially continually weighed down by it yeah they can be um continue weighed down and um the message i was trying to to get across is as a male um in the film and the story what really helped me with my mental health was uh speaking out and letting people know about the weight i was carrying that was the first step i i let people know you know I'm dealing with something. I'm dealing with this. And then the weight started getting easier. So yeah. um, metaphorically, at the end of the film, I basically uh, f- complete the challenge. And uh, and the challenge was basically opening up and taking the weight off. Yeah. So that in itself is a challenge for people with mental health is just the opening up, you know, letting people know that you you, you can be de- seemed as weak, you know, or whatever oh he's got problems or she's got problems and you, you don't want to um kind of open up so you, you kind of keep yourself closed that's probably with mental health that's one of the most challenging things is opening up just letting people know that you're not feeling great um and that whole iron man is pretty much the journey of trying to open up and then right at the end i open up and someone says how are you feeling I, and i say i'm I'm feeling better now that I've got this off my chest and I take the weight off, yeah, that sort of thing. Hmm. So in, in terms of your, your your own sort of mental health journey, w- was that something you were going through as you literally, as you went into doing this Ironman and it was almost, the Ironman was almost part of helping you to confront those issues? Uh, well, to an extent, I'm, I've, I've had um, very s- severe anxiety um gripping gripping anxieties since uh, sort of 2015 was when i got diagnosed with um, panic disorder 
uh, which is like a heightened anxiety. It's, it come, it came in a physical presence for me. So it took me to have physical symptoms that are resultant from mental health issues for me to realize I had a mental health issue. That's how poor um, I was educated in mental health and also how bad the stigma is in showing weaknesses, you know, as a man. I would get heart palpitations that felt like a heart attack. And then I was going to the A&E and they said, there was nothing wrong with your heart. You're completely fine. And it was just me having heightened cortisol levels. And basically throughout time, uh, since understanding I do have gripping anxiety, I've built a lifestyle which revolves around prevention of poor mental health around anxiety and outdoors adventures running sports that sort of thing has really helped my, my perspective with my mental health so i find that i get this thing called flow this optimal state of consciousness like i said um, those moments of total absorption you know when you, you're not there anymore like your, your self vanishes and you know time time kind of disappears and you're just you're just in the moment and I get that from like trail running or from uh, outdoor sports. S some people get it from drawing or, you know, creating art, or some people might get it from meditation or making music. I get it from outdoor sports. And so wh when I'm almost doing these challenges, they almost are like prescriptions, nature prescriptions. I'm getting my time in flow. Uh, I'm in a happy state and I really, I really do find them really enjoyable. And people say, wow, like an Iron Man with a weighted vest is enjoyable to you. And I said, <laughs> well, in some ways, yeah, it is. I mean, you know, it's not about pain. I'm not feeling the pain. What I'm getting out of it is I'm in outdoor spaces focused on one or two things, which is, you know, running or the sport I'm doing, uh, you know, eating and uh, drinking. And all my mind, all the racing thoughts and worries disappear because I've only had to focus on those two things. So, in yeah, to answer your question, yeah, I do get quite a lot of, I guess outdoor therapy from doing these sort of challenges, but also I, I enjoy them and 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 they g give me a lot of um, mental resilience training as well. Um, yeah, I like I like to do these challenges to build uh, mental fitness. I call it just like physical fitness. I think the mind is something we can train to be more resilient and uh, adaptable uh, and stronger. And um, that that I think has been my journey through a lot of challenges I've done up until the Ironman and. Uh, I guess the thing that people do generally ask is you keep going more and more extreme with your challenges. Where does the line stop? And I said, well, the line will stop, um, <laughs> I guess, when I'm not feeling you know, challenged anymore, I guess, or um, I'm not feeling I'm getting the flow or I'm not enjoying it. And I think that's when the line would stop and I will, I will stop doing these challenges. But right now I get a lot of fulfillment out of them. Yeah, I want to talk to you about some of the challenges you've done so people can get an idea of exactly what you've sort of accomplished in this field. But but one thing that occurs to me speaking to you there is how much it it tells what you've achieved, tells the uh, the lie to this kind of ridiculous stereotype that people who, you mentioned it yourself earlier, I think, people who have mental health problems, anxiety, depression, et cetera, are inverted commas weak or whatever, and they're somehow inferior to, to other people. A lot of us will have to confront those kind of issues as we go through and actually what you've achieved and what other people probably in a similar situation have achieved just proves that 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 stereotype is is ridiculous really yeah I mean it's completely okay not to be okay and I, I see that now but at the time I didn't and um, when when, I, when my, my first mental health issues started coming I didn't see that I was just very much you know very macho oh you know, I can get through this I'll do another hard day of pushing through the long hours of work and over overworking myself and all these things and you know i find that when push comes to shove like i've done big big challenges i've rode across the atlantic ocean that pales in comparison to the first person i said i had a mental health issue with that that moment was so much harder to overcome and 40 days at sea rowing 24 hours you know seven days a week like that it, that's the difference and you know if people take anything from that from, away from this is that if you can support someone to open up uh, and 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 uh, that that will help their journey more more ways than any anything else could two parts to this question how can people if if i was to see someone who i think oh, they seem to be struggling how could i persuade them to open up and also if you're in that situation yourself how how i mean how did you take that that really hard first step of saying hey i 
have mental health issues here? Well, it was first I kind of being told that I think you might have some issues from a doctor, a doctor first, because I went thinking I had physical issues. Right. <laughs> that's how that's how yeah. daft it was. I was thinking I had a heart problem. And yeah. then they started saying, no, actually, you have a mind problem. I said, what, what are you on about? What's that? <laughs> And, and mental health was just, I just didn't know much about it uh, at the time. And then, then I started researching it and I was like, okay, they're starting to make sense. So I think from my own research and correlating that with my own experiences and how I felt in certain situations to how they say maybe symptoms and things would feel, I started to, to realize actually there is a correlation here. I, I you know, I, I must, I must have it. So then I went for t- proper tests and yeah, they gave me a diagnosis, a proper diagnosis and it confirmed it occasionally um you know you come across people who are quite highly stressed or you feel that they have mental health issues perhaps you you've got an inkling right you, everyone is intuitive of the people around them their family friends this person is always worrying and is always stressed it looks like their their bags under their eyes it looks like they're not sleeping very well you, know, you can notice these things i think the best way to facilitate supporting someone is being showing vulnerability yourself a bit so if you go to somebody uh and you feel like they need you 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 feel like they need help and they're not willing to help themselves they're just keep going you know like i did i just kept going and going it it, it would be nice for someone to kind of open up saying you know i had a really hard a hard difficult day uh i you know i deal with this sort of thing and and it gives that sort of space to be able to kind of feel comfortable to share deep rooted things happening inside that you feel that you wanted to keep locked away but this person you feel like you could trust because they've opened up to you and I think that's that's kind of the way I'd go about it if you if you have friends or family or someone like that close to you that you know quite well is seen looks like they're dealing with something really really badly (laughs) I mean I've come across friends who swarm blind they never had any issues and then five years down the line they eventually opened up and they did have issues it can be quite difficult people find their own way in their own time to 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 open up but and i think it's a it's about society allowing these people you know these people who have issues to have the space to open up if we don't give them the space they never will um so let's uh work together and create an open atmosphere yeah, yeah, that that definitely makes sense. I think, you know, being honest and talking about everyone talking about kind of their own experiences of it and and like you say, opening up, I think that really, really helps. Uh, and then we can hopefully try and look at some solutions. Now, obviously, one of those solutions to you, as you said, has been doing these adventures and so on. Do, do you want to go through? I know you've mentioned a couple, but um, tell people about one or two of the other things you've done, because it's quite a list, isn't it? Yeah, I've I've got quite a quite a few different adventures. Yeah. So um I, I've done juggle in a different way. Uh John O'Groats to Land's End Cycle. I've done that in a in a unique way before. Um so I, I went um w- within a team, I, I created a team. We called ourselves the Eco Adventurers. Um and we cycled from Orkney to the Isles of Scilly. So um Orkney is an island just north of Scotland. And the Isles of Scilly is an island which is west of Cornwall in England. And essentially, Joggle is generally from north to south of uh, the you know, mainland UK. So from the northernmost point um, of Scotland to the southernmost point of England in Cornwall. And what we did is we extended it as a team and we were the first to uh, cycle across water. So not only did we cycle um, the island of Orkney, we cycled the uh, Pentland Firth, which is a stretch of water between Orkney Island and Scotland which has some of the fastest tidal streams uh, in it is sorry one of the f- fastest tidal streams in the world you could be in that water and be moved at a speed of 25 miles per hour at times it's that fast trust me when i say this we chose the perfect day to be able to do this cycle <laughs> across water and the water bike itself which we it's called a water bike it's essentially a, a you know imagine a spinning bike which is connected to two uh, elongated fenders with a propeller between the, the the two fenders and below the the spinning bike and it is connected with a drive chain and that's that's what we use to propel ourselves across um the sea 
we went on a neap tide where the water was at its like generally its lowest tide it's very very minimal movement the currents are very small and that allowed us to to go but we did need to get some piloting sort of support because there's whirlpools that you needed to avoid so um as ones who don't journey that way often we had to get support to do that and then we cycled from the U- the north of Scotland all the way through to the south of uh, Cornwall and we went through national parks and the ambition of um this this whole cycle journey was to raise awareness of environmental challenges and also raise awareness of climate solutions nature based climate solutions things that national parks are doing or things that grassroots projects are doing across the UK to protect and preserve the environment but also you know, scale up carbon storage for instance uh, um through natural means increase biodiversity in migratory corridors so we had conversations and interviews all across the entire way of the journey and then when we got to the end we didn't get to the end we had to cycle across water again and it was an eight hour cycle across water to the Isles of Scilly um, and the reason why we wanted to connect these two islands was because these two islands Orkney and the Isles of Scilly they both are very innovative sustainable um, locations where they're you know, if you ever visit them take some time to kind of talk about circular economy or the way they live on the islands is very self-sufficient and they have a lot of innovation around renewable energy technology up in Orkney where you wouldn't have that on mainland. So that's one of the adventures. Another, I guess, not so much an expedition of such, but uh, uh, an endurance world record is uh, I I hold the longest continual row um, on an indoor rowing machine. I rowed for three days and 11 hours nonstop um, three days and 11 hours yeah there's a long long way and the mental health I guess uh, tips that I got from that was that there was nothing that could keep me awake more than a human conversation yeah I couldn't believe it I could not do it without talking to someone I just had to talk about anything that was the thing that kept me going um and I think uh Podcasts are great as well because it felt like having a conversation, but it wasn't a proper conversation. So I've I've got that uh, uh, record. Um, and then I guess another adventure I already alluded to was the Atlantic row crossing. That was a big one. Hmm. Well, that was 40 days on a, sort of a, 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 a craft that was a very short, um, 29-foot boat with two cabins either side and rowing um, seated positions in the middle. And we just rowed across 20-foot rolling seas um from the canary islands to antigua uh, in a team of four uh, and then um last year before this ironman i did my first fkt fastest known time yeah um which was the welsh three peaks challenge so i ran the welsh three peaks challenge uh, which was um 230 kilometers and it summited uh, some of the highest mountains in, in wales which was um the northernmost mountain was uh, Mount Snowdon in uh, Snowdonia. And then I ran to South Snowdonia uh, and summited Cader Idris. And then I ran across um, the, the middle of Wales, which was spectacular, by the way. Anyone listening, if you want to find somewhere really cool to, to run and get lost in or trail run, um, middle of Wales, oh, so amazing. Um, and I, I cross country ran um, to uh, Pen- Penafan in S- South uh, Wales in Brecon Beacons National Park. And that, that was an incredible run. Um, that was my first solo outdoor adventure where I wasn't with anyone else. And it was all about the art of mindful running. So I wanted to experiment on art um, in, in, a, in a different way. When you run, you kind of draw a picture of, in your mind of, of the environment around you. So how can you use that picture that you're drawing in your mind of the environment around you to this kind of distract you a bit so that you can keep going for further and further uh, on the endurance run? And I found incredible powers of nature when I was running by myself out there. And it was just really awe-inspiring to know that if I was struggling and I was really tired and I was mentally thinking, oh my God, I've never run. Because I'd never run further than a marathon before this run. And I just sit down, I listen to the birds in the trees, I like watch a river or something like that. And it just inspired me to keep going. I was like, wow, this is such a beautiful place. We're so lucky to live in this place uh, and be around here. And it just gave me enough energy to keep going. So those are some of the challenges I've done. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, there's a fair few. That. Do, do, do you ever not just fancy a 5K park run? Uh, yeah, I do sometimes, actually. Yeah, I do. They're quite fun, those park runs. Just the, the crowds you get, the people, yeah. the community, uh, all walks of life, those park runs, um, all come in together for one thing, to run. Yeah. Yeah, love of running. Yeah, they, 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 are, they are really, really good. Just interested, actually, you, you mentioned that obviously you've started doing these adventures and so on because of some of the mental health impacts you had. You've learned these skills that help you mindful running for, for miles and miles and miles. Have you been able to bring those skills back into your everyday life to perhaps deal with some of the issues that you're having with stress at work or something? So you're having, you know, you can you can think mindfully when you're doing a uh, a long run but can you do it when you've got a tricky project at work have you cracked that code yeah yeah i guess um one of the things in society is the disruptive nature of technology isn't it it's uh it's not very human is it <laughs> yeah it's not uh, when i when it, I, I say not very human it's it's robotic it's cold it's 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 uh it's a lifestyle that we've we've created for in you know increased productivity and money um, and, you know, my work does revolve around screens. Um, I do a day to day job as an energy transition analyst, uh, as well as running two businesses. So I do quite a few different things. And technology is what I use to as my medium of work. And one of the things you know, that can really happen to me in my day to day basis is just too much screen time. I call it screen time. And I've learned to balance that with outdoor time and getting time outdoors, getting time in nature and, you know, I can't be mindful when I'm looking at a screen. There's just too much information, too much processing. I don't see the world around me. I don't, when I'm in a screen, I have to come away from the screen. So, you know, I, I always urge anyone who is working on screens as part of their job to get time outdoors because it's a true disconnection from, you know, in, increased notifications and overload of information but it's just astronomical at the moment and it's increasing. So we need to have outlets and outdoors is that outlet. And I've learned that from, you know, various different expeditions, adventures, endurance challenges, whatever you call it. I mean, it's very simple outdoor time balanced with screen time. I could, I, I literally learned that from walking in the woods when I had a really poor day um, in my bad mental health episodes in 2015, I uh, was urged to go on a long walk. And I went on a long, long walk and they, I was urged to just walk until my mind was clear. And I didn't quite get that concept and it worked. And since then I was like, yeah, I can do all these endurance challenges. I love it. I love the challenge of it, but I can get the same benefits from just doing, you know, walk in the woods or something like that. And yeah, I just talk about it in a Ted talk as well. If anyone's interested, I've got a Ted yeah. talk online called freedom and opportunity in the outdoors. And it's uh, yeah, all about, the ha it, it goes into the science of brain chemicals and how, you know, general society focus so much around screens that, you know, we are depleting our happy brain chemicals, brain chemicals, serotonin, oxytocin, you know, those sort of brain chemicals that you get from be being human, you don't get from screens. So serotonin, you're indoors all day looking at a screen. It's really difficult to get serotonin, isn't it? <laughs> so you need to get outdoors to get that really. Um, oxytocin, another thing that can't really get because it's due to you know exercise and movement and you can't really get that if you're sitting down looking at a screen you've got loads of uh other other endorphins and things like this that you just wouldn't get from general jobs nowadays unless they're like physical jobs so uh yeah i mean i've been able to translate a lot of these skills mindfulness is probably the best one and life balance with the outdoors is is very key for me yeah, I like to. I like this concept called free loose live. It's a Nordic concept, a Scandinavian concept. They they it's, it translates free loose live translates to open air living. And I don't know if, if anyone's listening who is Scandinavian or or, or knows of Scandinavia. They're very uh, outdoor centric. They they really pride their time outdoors in their lifestyles. And regardless of the weather, you know the weather's quite harsh out there. It gets seriously snowy, cold, but they're out there whatever the weather they're out there and they know the benefits of getting outdoors is really important for their sort of mental and physical health and i think you know my journey has been to retrain the importance of being outdoors and getting time in and exercise i i've had to learn through doing various different challenges and you know the benefits the tangible benefits i've been experimenting and actually living those benefits 
beforehand I took it for granted. Now I know I need it. You mentioned your the sort of online TED talk. We'll uh, we'll perhaps find a link and whack that in the show notes for people to oh, yeah. to have a look at. But I know some of your 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 work has gone into doing talks and speeches for for business and other and other places, telling your story and telling this, I suppose this this mantra of getting outside and mindfulness and so on. Yeah, I do do discussions with um, businesses. Yeah, my main my main focus really is now around environmental, uh, uh, I guess, activism or you know, championing. I call myself climate champion, but it, it's basically around the notion of how I've already alluded to you. Outdoors has protected me and my mental health. It has helped countless others during the pandemic. That one hour when we were in the UK, that one hour a day was a lifeline for a lot of people who had poor mental health. Being stuck indoors in the pandemic and then having that chance to walk out in a park that people really appreciated the nature that they had if they had nature and you know 10 minutes a day in nature has been scientifically proven to reduce stress levels and things like this um that's i think research by by cornell university but uh, back to my point is i like to protect the outdoors now so and i do a lot of you know environmental talks sustainable sustainability leadership talks why we should be protecting the environment? Why why should we care about climate change? Why should we be focused on climate solutions? Why should we be changing business policies to be focused more about protecting the planet, biodiversity? The reason why is because if we take away these outdoor spaces, we're at, we, you know we're we're inherently part of these this ecosystem. We take away sort of our lifeline. Yeah, from a mental health perspective, we you know it's very obvious that people who don't get much time outdoors for very expended you think about a prison inmate who's in, in, in prison all the time, right? That I know obviously they might be in prison because they've got mental health issues anyway, but beyond repair. But um, what I'm saying is th- th- those people are subjected to indoors time all the time. Their, their uh, physical and mental health is t- probably really deteriorated compared to anyone else. I was just going to say quickly, I mean, it's a bit of a political point, but but what did you make of the government announcement over the last week that rose back on a lot of the previous environmental promises yeah i think that was um based on a uh, business interest definitely it was vested business interest i uh, i think the the realization i know i have i have my own political views but i think there is a realization that it is expensive to do things sustainably everyone's aware of that to change all of our systems to to live sustainably is is it's hard. I mean, we're going to have to make sacrifices and it's going to cost a lot of money. And I think what happened with those those pullbacks on those decisions to have the oil and gas licenses and take imports of oil and gas and, all, you know, all these decisions that have been going almost feels like reverting back is based on the fact that there's a, you know, there's quite a lot of people who in power do not want to take the financial hit. And I think that's where it all came down to bottom line and it's from a personal perspective it's going to cost us lives is it worth it i mean the environment is intrinsic to everyone it doesn't matter how rich you are if there's no environment you're not there <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, well that's uh that's definitely 100 percent true isn't it we are we are on the edge of time here isaac so i just wanted to ask you one last question which was kind of going back to the, the the start of things really i guess irrelevant of whether they, they someone has a, a mental health problem or not but if they do how, how do they start doing not necessarily what you did but just getting out there and and being more more active what first steps can someone take along that road yeah i think um the, i think the first steps is is almost just treating it as the first step um if if you you know know if you know for sure you want to get outside but you don't have the energy to do it do it just try and do like a minute go a minute outdoors or something like this i mean some people really struggle to get outside and get outdoors maybe you have a trusted friend you could go out with first or something like this and you know to just get you started i uh, i think um people also listening are you know probably active and most of them outdoors if you know people who aren't very active and outdoors, but they look like they might be having a bit of you know, stress or mental health issues, maybe suggest that they take some time out to, you know, go in the garden if they have a garden or go to the local park or nature reserve and just have a walk and, and, and see how that makes them feel, you know, just say, have a go, 
see how it makes you feel you know let them sort of i guess decide but i think most people would agree on the podcast when they have time outdoors even if it's raining most people eventually would say yeah i really enjoyed that i really like that so um if yeah that's that's my my view on it yeah definitely we have we have that uh we have that that strange phrase amongst uh runners that skin is uh skin is waterproof don't we so. yeah we do yeah yeah the skin is waterproof it is if you keep moving <laughs> yeah, that's yeah it. So, i think so. i've i've seen i i've seen i don't know um if you come across there's some sort of cream you can put on now that repels water or something like this um just when you just you just reminded me of that i i need to experiment i've not tried that before whatever it is Oh, well, there we go, folks. That, that's a little bit of homework for us all to try and find <laughs> out what, what that is. But uh... Yeah, I, someone said they were using it for an, a, a journey so that they could feel less cold when they're doing their trail running. And I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah, definitely. Well, that, that'd be one for you for the to help with the, the next adventure. Uh, yeah, and, um, and your runs too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But but thank you so much for joining us today, telling us your story, telling us all the reasons behind it. And uh, and I wish you all the best with, I haven't been able to ask you what it's going to be, but with uh, whatever crazy next. challenge comes next. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's going to be triathlons outside of the UK. Uh, I've got some, uh, di- I want to experiment in different environments so different different places oh fantastic well we'll have to catch up again and, and talk about that down the line brilliant thanks craig thanks again to isaac kenyon for joining me today on the running tales podcast do go and check out his ted talk it's really inspiring well well worth a listen find the link in our show notes along with links to all isaac's social media profiles I really hope you enjoyed today's podcast. And if you did, we'd love you to give us a rating or review wherever you listen so more people can find stories like Isaac's. Thanks again for joining us today. And we'll see you again next week for another Running Tales podcast.